I think we, if we manage to simulate uh, brains uh, of small animals well, then we can scale it up fa- relatively quickly. Uh, so, I, and so I'm most concerned about our scientific abilities, but I would expect them somewhere mid-century and later. So I have a very broad probability distribution. I don't think we're going to get them in, uh, anytime soon in the next 20 years. But beyond that, I think there's a pretty good chance of getting them. It's going to be very much hard work to do it, but it's just hard work. It doesn't look like we need an ingenious insight, a new idea about how the brain works. It's quite possible that in the pursuit of making a virtual brain, we figure out the construction principles that produce useful brain functions and just put them into machines. For example, the cerebral cortex is essentially just a set of the same circuit repeated again and again and again, but it can do very different things. Some parts of my cortex is doing vision, some parts are doing hearing, other parts are doing mathematics. The thing that the same little circuit can do all these different things. That suggests that if we could just figure out how to do that, we would have a really useful component for our machines. And it's not implausible that the research into simulating uh, cortex, which of course a lot of scientists are very interested in, might tell us that. And then we're going to end up with machines that use this uh, bio-inspired subsystem. This might of course be a problem because it's kind of hard uh, to uh, create strict rules. If you want to, for example, control the safety of such a system, it might be, very, uh, it might be the same thing like the safety of an animal. You need to train it to behave in a safe way. And you might not have detailed control or even understand what's going on inside. You can't read out the neural activity of my brain because it's individual and rather messy. And similarly, these machines might also be individual and messy. We can, of course, make copies of them, which would be very convenient, but they would still have the same quirks. Generally, neuromorphic artificial intelligence, it makes a lot of sense. Traditionally, artificial intelligence have been borrowing some good ideas from neuroscience. I don't think it's been borrowing enormous numbers of ideas, actually. When you make a listing, you realize that you can probably count them with both your hands. They have been fairly good ideas, but they've also taken decades between a neuroscientist figuring something out and the AI researcher borrowing their version of it. So if neuroscience has some massive revolution, it's not necessarily that's going to lead to a massive revolution instantly in artificial intelligence. I don't know if we know what is promising in artificial intelligence. The most surprising thing about the history of artificial intelligence is how bad we are at predicting what's going to happen. And that's because it's all based on ideas. It's not so much of a hard engineering work as coming up with the right idea about how to do planning, how to represent data, how to learn new things. So that means that you're going to get surprises all the time. So I'm expecting that whatever finally solves the problem of AI is going to be something we currently have no good idea about. Afterwards, we might be saying, oh, yes, that's obvious. But it has not been obvious so far. I'm myself very fond of a statistical learning approach. I think we can do an enormous amount of useful work simply by taking loads of data and processing it. Uh, so I'm very much a fan of a kind of a big data and a deep network approach to things. But that's probably just my bias of being an original neuroscientist. Uh, I think an intelligence explosion, something recursively self-improved, is a possibility. We don't know whether it's likely or unlikely. And this is an important question because intelligence explosions, if they're fast, are very dangerous. So if we could just pin down whether it's likely to get rapid self-improvement or not, that would tell us a lot of useful things about how we should shape the future. I personally think that rapid self-improvement is probably possible in machine intelligence because they can rewrite their own source code, they can run faster, they can do various forms of experimentation that is rather hard to do on a normal brain. Evolution is an obvious process that has generated intelligent minds using trial and error. And we can probably do better than evolution. It's just that how much better? That's hard to tell. So on one hand, it could be that an intelligence explosion is actually an intelligence expansion. You have a lot of uh, systems generating better systems. It's not always obvious uh, which ones are better. So you have a big market and it gets integrated with the rest of the market humans have. So essentially, it's all of the planet kind of getting smarter, more smart devices and smart humans and smart machines. That's kind of acceptable. It might still be enormously turbulent and dramatic, but it also means that uh, there is a chance of getting human values into it. The really scary form is, of course, if you have one piece of software that could improve itself rapidly, find ways of proving that this way I'm going to be even faster, doing that, thinking even better, improving its intelligence very, very rapidly, 
that means that very quickly it's going to be dominant because intelligence is the ability of getting what you want. So the scary thing about a rapid intelligence explosion is that it's hard to get the right values into it. Intelligence is the ability to get what you want. The problem is, of course, that an arbitrary piece of software might very well have very bad values. Nobody might even have thought about adding any sensible value system. So it just amplifies itself. So now it's a lot of power, but it might have plans which are completely crazy. I think the best way of reducing the likelihood of an uncontrolled intelligence explosion is to research it more, to figure out what could intelligence explosions be, both in terms of knowing a bit more certainly whether they're likely or not. Uh, because if they seem likely, then of course we can get more resource to bear on the problem. But also figuring out something about the dynamics. For example, is it possible to make more intelligence by just changing an algorithm? Or do you need a lot of experience and data from the world in order to make more intelligence? If it's the later, in that case we're probably going to be rather fine because it's hard to do it very rapidly because you need to do stuff in the world. While in the first case, you could imagine a little black box sitting thinking, coming up with ways of becoming more and more powerful until it's unstoppable. But we also need to think about better ways of thinking about these problems. We don't have a good science of intelligence. We definitely don't have any good science or philosophy of superintelligence yet. However, the nice thing is unexplored areas typically have a lot of low-hanging fruit. There are probably a few obvious theorems and things we can discover just by doing a little research. The number of people who've been seriously investigating these questions can easily fit into a normal seminar room. And uh, they have not been spending an enormous amount of effort or a career on it. There are many academic disciplines that have thousands of times as much effort. But this small group has already kind of found out a few interesting things. And uh, as uh, research grows, we can find out more. Eventually, typical research fields peters out. The, it becomes harder and harder to make more and more advanced results, and you need more and more money and grad students to do it. But right now, in the early days, just a modest increase in effort can actually give us a lot more useful information, which can then tell us where we actually should put our money and effort. I think decision theory can be very useful. I also think we need to... We probably need to invent a whole bundle of new theories about self-improving systems. And the interesting thing here is that they are by their nature very interdisciplinary. Economists, after all, looking at economic growth, have also been studying self-improving systems. It's just that they rarely consider what they study to be a part of artificial intelligence. But when you consider it in the right light, of course, a corporation is a kind of artificial intelligence. It's built out of uh, humans, which are natural intelligences, but quite often large organizations function almost decoupled from the individual smarts of members, especially bureaucracies, which can be utterly, utterly indifferent for any rational thinking, but just following the rules. So we can take ideas from economics, uh, for example, and start looking at them from both a philosophical, decision theoretic and a computational perspective. I think there are many other domains where we can actually learn things about self-improvement on the large scale. When you look at the world economy, for example, it's been growing roughly at 2% per year for a very long time. It's a very stable economic trend. It might have been picking up every time you go from hunter-gatherer to an agricultural society and then to industrial. So historically, economic growth has been fairly stable at around 2% per year, at least after the Industrial Revolution. And it's fairly hard for any country to grow faster than that for a sustained period of time. So to some economists, the whole idea about the uh, intelligence explosion or singularity sounds completely crazy because that's essentially a prediction that the economic growth uh, is going to suddenly go through the roof. So some economists have been trying to model economic growth in various ways. So there are so-called endogenous growth models, which uh, they have a tendency to stagnate or blow up through the roof, which most people would say uh, speaks against them. But there might also be a model, actually, that there might be technological singularities. If technology makes it easier to make more technology, then the logical conclusion would seem to be that things accelerate enormously. In the real world, things might not necessarily have a pure mathematical singularity, but it might certainly change radically. Why it has not happened yet? That's an important thing. I don't think the economists have uh, any good agreement or understanding of where I actually think we can learn quite a lot for our computer systems. And similarly, of course, a lot of attempts of making self-improving computers tend to stagnate for other reasons we don't understand. When running artificial life and the evolutionary algorithms, typically performance tends to, at first it's rapid and then it levels off. 
why does it level off? Why don't we see some continual improvement like uh, in the real uh, biological world? That's again something we really should start comparing notes with the paleontologists and evolutionary biologists. And so I think we're going to learn a lot more as we get more interdisciplinary. I'm not that hopeful about society ever being ready for any important change. Uh, it's simply too big, too di diverse. There are always going to be some people who didn't get the memo about what's going to happen. Also, a lot of these f changes we're thinking about are unprecedented changes. There is nothing in the past that uh, looks anything like it. So people are going to be using the wrong analogies. A lot of thinking about the singularity tends up to be kind of religious. Oh, the great rapture is coming. So the great change and we're going to, uh, is happening and we're going to be lifted up and become god -like, Or maybe it's just the end of the world. But those are the wrong analogies. That's not going to help us very much in actually deciding what the right thing to do is. So in general, we might need to figure out better ways of thinking about the future in general which is part of what we're interested in at our institute, but it's also a very profound sociological question which might not even have a proper answer. So I think what the best we can do is to scan out some of the possibilities, investigate these possibilities and see where we really should be ringing the warning bells rather strongly. And sometimes it might turn out that uh, we're completely wrong, we're worried about a problem that doesn't exist, which is fine. Uh, but actually figuring out where we might need to uh, show some caution can be very, very valuable. And sometimes you can even work out things carefully before doing a project. Famously in the Manhattan Project, as the Americans were developing the first nuclear weapon, some of the scientists started wondering, could a nuclear explosion cause a fusion reaction in the atmosphere, igniting the whole atmosphere and destroying the planet? And they actually took it seriously enough to do a little bit of study. The study was published after the Trinity detonation, but they actually had done the math before. And they had convinced themselves that this is absolutely safe, actually, given physics we know we understand well. However, the report ended with the note that, yes, this is early days, and we should probably return to this kind of analysis in the future, and it's a good thing to do. Of course, there had never ever been such a report. No project I ever heard of did a study like this before setting out to do something potentially dangerous. Uh, so, for example, when people started getting worried about particle accelerators and maybe they could create black holes or strangelets, the physicists, uh, first they poo-pooed the whole idea. Oh, it's absolutely safe. Nothing has gone wrong so far. And finally, we were kind of forced to write some papers uh, proving that it was safe. Except, of course, that these proofs are always a little bit suspect, not just because they're written by people who have an interest in the outcome, but also that they're based on the physics that we're now trying to test with these particle accelerators. Still, I think these arguments actually are good. I think they do show that particle accelerators, as we currently have them, are perfectly safe. It's just that it turned out to be far more complicated to prove that than you would expect. In particular, the probability of being wrong with a, a complex scientific argument is actually pretty big compared to the risks that we're willing to take with the planet. So in order to prove in a certain way that this particle accelerator is not going to blow up the planet, it's not enough to have an argument that it's zero probability of it happening. Because there is, might be a 1% chance that argument is wrong. So you would ideally want to have a completely independent, separate argument based on some other assumptions, other ways of analyzing the thing that also showed that it was safe. Together, of course, they reduce uh, the risk uh, to something between zero and one chance in 10,000, which is already pretty good. But in order to be really certain about the future of plan, we probably would want four or five different papers like that. If you do that, then you can actually bound a uh, risk that, uh, so you can prove that it's rather safe although your individual arguments might be fallible. So you need to do careful reasoning in order to handle these small probability high impact risks. And most people are really bad at it, including particle physicists, not to mention, of course, political decision makers. So the precautionary principle in its formal form is completely sensible. Uh, if you don't know if something is risky, make sure you figure out uh, the risks, but also be cautious. The problem is that it's often uh, applied, of course, in order to uh, prevent people from doing anything new, because it could be dangerous. That's a bit like saying you should question everything, and then people, instead of uh, looking into whether, what the true answer is, they just say, oh, I can question everything, I don't need to care about anything. 
The problem, of course, is that a lot of people just try to use principle in whatever way suits them. What we actually should be doing is, of course, look at what we have reason to think there could be risky stuff. If something involves high energy or global consequences of something that's self-replicated, then it's probably potentially very dangerous. If it's naturally self-contained, well, then it's much less risk to think it could be dangerous and we can go ahead. But we also need to be pro-actionary. We actually need to look at what are the possible gains. Sometimes the great gains are worth fairly serious risks. So one of the problems we might be facing as a civilization right now is that we become a little bit too risk averse. So we're facing great risks in the future. But in order to handle them, we actually might need to take a few risks too. Calculated risks, but deliberately taking some risks can be very healthy. Uh, and it's a very safe approach. Uh, if you don't do anything new, you're going to be certain to get what you had. Except, of course, that the world is changing. You can't be certain that you're going to be able to retain what you had because the underlying systems in the world might one day turn out to be very different.